The importance of demographics is often overlooked by financial analysts. Alain Barbeza is investment manager at Banque Cantonale Vaudoise. He's joined us today to review the Chinese demographics and the impact it has on the capital transfer from North to South Asia. Alain, good afternoon. Good afternoon. First question, Chinese demographics is pretty catastrophic. Can you go back on a little bit of history? Sure. Um, China has a reputation that um, its leadership often goes to very extremes and Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping certainly have lived up to that reputation uh, in the sense that uh, Mao, after having engendered the Great Famine uh, of 1951 to, uh, 1959 to 1961, uh, has decided that he wanted as many uh, Chinese citizens as possible in the world. Um, but clearly, very, very quickly, his um, policies proved to be unsustainable. And towards the end of his life, the, the Beijing technocrats tried to reverse it uh, through a policy uh, which was called Wan Xiaoxi, uh, which means later, long uh, and few, uh, meaning uh, getting married later, having children um, later, and therefore uh, fewer as well. Um, and that proved relatively successful in the sense that the fertility rate um, halved in about 10 years. But when Deng Xiaoping came to power, he was not satisfied with these results. And he implemented what has become known as the one-child policy. Um, and that was pretty catastrophic um, in the sense that uh, the population, uh, the, the fertility rate uh, fell drastically. Now, uh, these policies have had a significant impact on the age structure and on the labour force of China. Um, what do we see today? Well, by 2020, which is in less than five years' time, the um, old population um, will grow by 60%. By old, we mean 65 years and, and, and over. Uh, the working age population, 15 to 64, will at the same time shrink by 35%, uh, which is unseen in, in the world uh, today. Um, the if, even if the um, one-child policy was scrapped altogether um, today, um, that wouldn't change anything for China for the next generation. Why? Because the people that will make the working population in the 2020s and 2030s have already been born and you know, they cannot be increased. So we know that for at least the next 25 years um, there will be a shortage uh, of, uh, of workers in, uh, in China. Uh, an unintended effect of the one-child policy is a decrease, uh, a dramatic decrease, of the male to female ratio. There are now far less females in China than anywhere else in the world, and that will compound the problem, to which we can also add the problem of the migration between the agricultural world to the urban world, which is also going to decrease China's potential growth. Can, how, how, what are the problems with, with the females? Why are so many men, men in China? And where is China in, a, in this turning point between the old balance of low salaries in a very ample reserve of agricultural manpower uh, and the future? Mm -hmm. Those are two distinct problems, but at the end, they compound themselves, make you know, Chinese um, demographic problems even worse. Um, there are today 118 female for every male in China. Um, now, we are born naturally uh, at a ratio of 105 men, 400 uh, women in the world. Most countries in the world have a ratio of 106 to 100. Um, as I said, China today is 118 to 100. Uh, the projections um, say that by uh, at the moment that it will peak uh, at about 2050, that ratio will grow to 186 men for every 100 women. 
I repeat nearly, those numbers, 186 for 100 women. That's nearly double. That's nearly double. Maybe, you know, for once in a lifetime, Chinese uh, women will have the upper hand over men uh, in one part of their, of their life. Uh, let's put it that way, um, to have a silver lining to that story. But, you know, there's a huge um, gender imbalance that uh, is already taking place. That has enormous repercussion, uh, both economically and potentially socially as well. Um, you know, so many um, unmarried men, um, mm. maybe... Could you know, be volatile. It's a bit volatile, exactly. <laughs> um, as far as the, the big migration from China is, in, inside China is concerned, um, there are today more people living in the urban uh, part of China than in, uh, in the, the rural part. Um, at the beginning, this is extremely positive um, in the sense that you have um, low-skilled, cheap labor coming to um, you know, the different industries, and that keeps the salaries low. Um, now that migration is mostly behind us, which means the pressure to keep salaries low is disappearing and the cost associated with this is, is increasing and therefore profits, you know, companies' profits will be under pressure, um, investment will be in, under pressure. If China were to reverse its one-child policy, there is no guarantee that it will work, uh, as has been seen, for example, in Korea. Can you... Give us a little bit of insight about what happened in Korea, because I think it's really quite a good example. It is. Um, Korea started a population planification, if, uh, if I may say so, in 1962. Um, it increased it in 1982 uh, in the wake of Deng Xiaoping's introducing the one-child policy in China. And it scrapped it all together in 1996. At that time, the fertility rate, which is basically the number of children a woman can have you know, during her lifetime, um, was 1.6. The natural rate of uh, replacement um, in, in the world for population is 2.1. So it was way below that, uh, that level in 1996. Uh, by 2005, i.e. about 10 years after it scrapped their quote-unquote one-child policy, um, that ratio was 1.08, so it didn't reverse, it you know, kept on going down. Um, today it's 1.3, slightly better, but still way below the 1.6 um, about 30 years ago. Um, so you know, maybe China would be different, um, maybe Chinese are different from Koreans. Well, th there is a general trend that the richer a country gets, the, the lower the fertility rate can't really see why China would be different. Um, honestly, I don't. Um, but again, uh, you know, this, it still has a big rural population um, of you know, several hundred millions of people. Um, maybe these people live differently than um, you know, we do in, 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 in more developed part of, of, of the world and they will go for more, more children because the, 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 the uh, infant mortali mortality is still, s still higher than, than, than everywhere else. But again, there are more people in the cities today than in, in the rural areas. So overall, probably the best China can do is stabilize its fertility ratio, which is today at officially 1.5, uh, but according to demograph the demographs, uh, it's closer to 1.2, so you know, where Korea was um, in 2005. Now, while in Northern Asia, uh, population is spiraling down because it's China, but it's also Taiwan, and it's also Thailand, and it's also Japan, which is the best known case. In Southern Asia, the population is still increasing drastically with some important economic effects. Well. The, the difference in the age pyramid between North Asia and, and South Asia is... Which is we can see here on the graphic. Exactly. It's, it's absolutely striking. Um, you have about 1.5 billion people living in Northeast Asia, which is Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong uh, and, and Macau, and 2.3 billion people living in, in South Asia. Um, these people are young. Um, but most importantly, the um, 
the middle class is growing very fast. So if um, you look at from North Asia's you know, point of view, uh, where is the, the next growth is it's that part of that part of Asia and we're seeing increasing uh, capital transfer uh, or transfer of capital to South Asia from North Asia. As a matter of fact there, is, there was a, a survey done uh, this year by two institutes in Japan, the Jetro Institute and the Japan Development Bank and both showed that increasingly Japanese um, companies are relocating their production base um, either out of Japan but also out of China um, to South Asia and the main reason for that wasn't cost advantage it was a growing uh, demand coming from, from, from that region. Yes we can see it also on this graphic where uh, clearly uh, uh, Japanese companies are investing more in Asia than they are in China but also that strong demand is the most important factor for that decision, whereas cost advantage actually ranks fairly low. Exactly. So the future is in South Asia? Well, at least as, as, as a long-term investor, um, I pay attention to you know, demographic trends. Um, they are maybe on a day-to-day -day basis, they do not seem to be important but they are the, one of the main driver of an economic success or downfall. And I'm paying even more attention to where those same companies that I'm investing in are putting their capital and I have a tendency to follow them. Thank you very much, Alain. That was really very interesting. Thank you.